All right. So clearly I missed out because I did not get to hear any Oasis last night. <laughs> so if you could just sing right now, that'd be awesome. I'm just kidding. Um, I want to start out because you have such an interesting story. You, I read about you, you were eating Hot Pockets in your college dorm. You didn't know what you were going to do. You had this small startup and you turned it into a billion dollar company. That's not easy, as I'm sure a lot of folks here know. Um, and I want to start with a commencement speech where you went back to MIT and you told everybody, Drew said, if I had a cheat sheet that I could give to myself, um, it would have a, a tennis ball and the number 30,000 on it. So as we, before we kind of get into the, the nuts and bolts of the company, can you just explain that tennis ball and the number 30,000 to these folks? Sure. Um, so it was fun. I, I did the, as you mentioned, I did the commencement speech at MIT last year. And it was just kind of surreal. I'm like, it's been kind of a crazy path from the you know, uh, seven or eight years since I graduated. What would I tell myself again? And um, the tennis ball was really this, this uh, for any of you who had dogs growing up, you know what a dog chasing a tennis ball looks like, <laughs> right? Like a, a little crazy, um, but like nothing will get in the way, right? And so it's really about uh, the idea of finding something you're obsessed with. And, um, and, and one thing I've learned is that the, the founders of these companies who, who go for a long time are really, like, they're solving problems that matter. They're solving problems that they're obsessed with, like big problems. And, and that, for me, was the start of Dropbox. Um, and the 30,000 was based on something, I was just, it, it was, I just moved from Boston to San Francisco, and I was, I couldn't sleep, so I was sitting in my room just, you know, reading, and, and I read this, sentence that says, you're going to live for 30,000 days. And you sort of think about it. You imagine like a big stack of like <laughs> tickets or you know, a calendar, and every day you're just tearing one off. And if you think about that for a little bit, you know, you're like, OK, yeah, we don't live forever, obviously. But then I, I went to the calculator, and I'm like, all right, I was like 20, I don't know, 24 at the time. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm like eight or 9,000 days down. So it's not like this last room's like, oh, like it's not like I'm a, a thousand days, it's like I'm like right. a th almost a third <laughs> through my life. And so that, that kind of had a lot of impact on how I the think about things. Fire. So Dropbox is essentially your tennis ball. You're chasing. Um, you all of a sudden, and the idea for Dropbox, you have said, kind of came as a bit of a distraction because you were working on SAT prep and online course, and then you got <laughs> bored and you were working on a poker bot and you're you know, clearing your mom's house and putting up computers and <laughs> trying to build a poker bot. So like, then you got really, really passionate about file storage. So just, we don't have to do this long, but can you take me from poker bot, the SAT, to file storage and why you were going to go headfirst towards that? Sure. So when I was in school, I, I took a leave of absence for a year. And I started my first company. Um, and, and a lot of college age entrepreneurs, you know, and you think about what companies you start, you, you, you really, start with what you know. So I knew like test prep and how hard it was to apply to college. And so I made, uh, my first company was called Accolade, did, line on, did online SAT prep. And it was great for the first couple of years because I was like, this is awesome. I'm like, come up with a logo, like Photoshop a logo and I'm, and I'm gonna print out business cards that say founder on them <laughs> and I'm gonna hand them out. Uh, so we all remember these, these little milestones. Um, but the problem was, for those of you who have had the pleasure or pain of taking the SAT or any kind of college admissions test, uh, you, know, you can only write so many questions, so many math questions involving like parallel lines or involving like the trains that leave you know, two cities and cross somewhere in the middle. And so I was starting to, so I started working on this company and I realized that at some point I just wasn't, wasn't super interested in the problem that I was solving. And, and I thought I was, I felt guilty because I'm like, oh, I'm just not working that hard or something's wrong with me. And then I, get, I come across this distraction where, uh, especially in college, I loved playing online poker. And I loved, uh, and people said you could, uh, it was not possible to make a bot that plays automatically for you. And, I'm, and I was, wanted to prove that it was possible. And so I had this crazy side project where um, I, had done a verse, I had done a bunch of reverse engineering and, and deep technical stuff to figure out how the poker clients work and then figure out a way to make uh, my computer play for me. 
Yeah. And so it's kind of this crazy thing. And, and then what was interesting about that, uh, unfortunately, like playing poker, online poker became like more illegal in the US right around that time. So I stopped working on it. Uh, <laughs> but what was interesting, I was like, I was like obsessed with this thing. I like couldn't sleep. I was working like all hours a day. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm not defective. Like, right. uh, it's just I need something that I'm excited about. And so then the idea for Dropbox came along when uh, I forgot my thumb drive. So this thing that's happened to millions of us, uh, certainly back in the day, it just drove me so crazy because I'm like, this is insane. In the future, all your stuff will just follow you around. This idea of having to like back up your computer or email yourself stuff or all these things that we have to do today, we're going to look really stupid. Um, so what are we going to have? And, and came up with this idea of really just trying to solve this problem for myself because I'm like, I never want to have to carry around a thumb drive again. And so you stopped eating Hot Pockets, and you went to Silicon Valley, and, um, and you went to Y Combinator. I was still eating for, Hot Pockets. You still ate Hot That's good to know. <laughs> um, and you went to Y Combinator. You had to break in. You didn't have the Silicon Valley contacts, which I know a lot of people have trouble breaking in. And, and other people were working on this kind of thing at the same time. What do you think it was that allowed you to kind of break in and get that first round of funding? Well, one of the good things about Y Combinator is it's a totally open application process. And so literally anyone can, if you have an idea, you can write down sort of a mini business plan, uh, and then they sift through them and pick the hand, you know, the, at, the, at the time, roughly 20 that they thought that they liked the most. And um, I was fortunate in that some of my college friends and other friends had done Y Combinator before. So they had taught me a little bit about what to expect and how excited they were about being part of the program. And so um, at the time, I, I mean, actually, my, my Y Combinator application is just available on the internet for anyone right. uh, who wants to read it. And, and I think, you know, the, 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 the Y Combinator partners, they, they look for, you know, is the problem you're solving important? Does it, you know, do you have an engineering background? Can you, you know, or it, whether an engineering background or not, can you actually build it? Um, but it was a really great introduction and, uh, and helped me get plugged into the Valley. And so let's fast forward to the phone call you got from Steve Jobs saying, <laughs> come on in, and you get there, and you said he's your hero. And apparently, they, Steve Jobs wanted to acquire you guys, mm. right? I mean, what? Just take us, because not all of us have sat in a room with Steve Jobs and, and had him <laughs> offer to acquire our company, and then turned him down. Can you just take us really quickly through exactly how that went down? So it, w it was interesting. They, so w when you're working on a company and, and you start to show progress, then you're, all the big internet companies are going to come are going to want to meet with you because they find what you're doing interesting or they want to buy your company. So that's a, that's a pretty normal uh, state of affairs. But it was kind of surreal. Uh, I remember the day that the meeting was set up. Like, I'm like, Arash, my co-founder, and I, we get in our zip car. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, we've got to figure out the map to Apple headquarters. And so we start typing in one infinite loop. And we're like, oh, it's already in the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, and so you show up and you know your reception and um, you know you're like wait what do I say like we're here to see Steve, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's cool and and he, he was very complimentary he he's stated things pretty simply he was like you guys have a great product and you should consider becoming part of Apple and how much did he offer we didn't talk about numbers oh. do you want to talk oh you didn't talk about I didn't numbers. I didn't okay. want to talk about numbers yeah. I, you know uh, I got a piece of advice. Uh, from one of my friends who's like, if you don't want to sell your company, don't talk about selling your company. Right. And so that was the last, one of the last conversations of that kind we ever right. had. But he, you know, he's very, um, it was a really complimentary meeting and, and I mean, definitely an interesting life experience. And you know, fast forward years later, Apple, Google, Amazon, everybody's launched these services that are you know, driving down the cost of uh, free storage. So, you know, what is your game plan now? How do you compete with these huge players who are now in the space and aggressively in the space? So I think you know, the first thing to remember is we've always had competition. So this is not like a new thing for us. Um, this is actually kind of the best case scenario. This is like what, you know, when Arash and I were in our apartment in San Francisco, we're like, I hope one day we have, you know, we're, we do so well that everybody thinks this is a, a really important, or everybody knows how important this problem is. Um, and so I think, it, you know, how we handle that is I, I think the whole industry is kind of evolving and getting to this next phase, 
where in the beginning, it really was about storage, right? Just the basics of having your stuff backed up, being able to get from your, to your files from your phone, like that was like the big thing. Um, but now it's really about the experience. And, uh, and about, there, there's all kinds of other aspects that come into play. Like, remember when you, you got your first cell phone? You're like, oh, this is awesome. You know, I have like a phone without wires. Uh, how many minutes do I have on my plan? Mm -hmm. Right? And now it's not so much about, oh, how many minutes do I have? It's like, I want the iPhone plan. And so when, when you think about uh, Dropbox, what people love about Dropbox is it's really easy. You know, how much space do you get? You get plenty of space. And, and now it's much more about, well, how can we help you organize your stuff? How can we make your stuff useful? How can we support all the different platforms that you use? And, and things, uh, we had some news today about, about Microsoft and a partnership we're doing there. Like, how can we make the experience better? And that's really what sets us apart and will be more important going forward than just gigabytes. But it's certainly easy. It's certainly hard because if you think about it, a lot of these companies that are startups and turn into these big billion dollar companies, at first everyone's like, no way that's going to work. And then all of a sudden it kind of does and they just charge forward. You have had to deal with naysayers from the get-go and, and you still deal with mm -hmm. it. Psychologically as a founder, you seem so laid back, but like, how do you, how do you deal with it? I mean, like in the office, can you like go into a tirade? I mean, you've had people saying no all along. People still say no, even though the company's doing mm -hmm. very, very well, um, more so than in other companies in the Valley. So how do you personally deal with it as a founder? I think you just get used to it. It's never fun when people kind of throw rocks at you or your company, but when you look out, when you get some perspective or you, you've been at this for a little while, this happens to every company, maybe particularly the successful ones, right? How many articles were there about Facebook, you know, and Zuck? Uh, and there have been a lot of really great, happy things written about them, but every couple of years, it's like they go from the company that can do no wrong to the company that can do no right, and the same thing has been true with Dropbox. And so I think at some point, uh, I mean, it's important to realize, one piece of advice I got was, you know, you're never quite as good as people say you are, but you're never quite as bad either. And just mm -hmm. understand that this is all part of the, the evolution. I mean, um, obviously, it, obviously, it's a roller coaster. Now we keep hearing, and I know they mentioned this in the intro, about privacy and security. Because every other day, even as a reporter, every other yeah. day I'm, I'm getting the call, oh, Lori, you have to come on and talk about this breach and this breach. Mm. How do you ensure people, now that we just keep hearing more and more about these data breaches, that their information and their data in the cloud is safe? What, are, what active steps are you guys taking? Well, it's an area where you have to make huge investments, right? And we're always looking for more things to do. And, and there are a number of technical things from encrypting your files and your data as they, uh, when they're in transit or when they're at rest, and there's all kinds of things like that. From a product security standpoint, we're always looking for more things to do, like two-factor authentication, all kinds of uh, additional technical stuff under the hood. And then you work together as an industry. So things like passwords, is there a way that we can make that easier for people? So uh, we joined up with Google. Uh, formed a coalition called Simply Secure. How can we protect people even when you know, they do things uh, they're not supposed to do, like reuse passwords or things like that? Which everyone does, by the way. I no longer do because I did a story on hacking and someone tweeted my password at me. But I, I mean, are passwords a little antiquated? Do you think we'll, we'll get well, beyond that's, that? Well, that, that, that? That's why it's important to things like, it's called two-factor two authentication. Yeah. So it's a measure of protection beyond your password. Um, and this is something, you know, the same way that you, you put a lock on your house. We're trying to make really easy steps for people to keep their account safe. And, I, and I'm going to bring up Snowden because I, you can't not bring up Snowden. He said that, and this is, these are his words, not mine, Dropbox is hostile to privacy, and he called for more services to offer knowledge encryption, zero knowledge encryption, so where you guys know less. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, th I think it's... I, I don't think it, I, privacy, like our business runs on trust. Um, and I think Matthew said that, well, the whole internet, uh, all the internet companies' businesses run on trust. Um, and so I think it, the, the, one of the challenges is like passwords or like anything else, you have this trade off in some cases between usability and convenience and security. Um, and what we offer people is choice. And so if you, if you're familiar with things like zero knowledge encryption or client side encryption, there's different names for it. It's basically encrypting things yet another time uh, before they're also encrypted as we send them through Dropbox. Uh, 
you know, uh, we understand the motivation for that, but, but then there are downsides. So if you do that, then you can't, it's really hard to search your stuff. You might not be able to get to your stuff from your phone. You might not be able to integrate third-party apps. Um, and so what we do is offer people choice where they can either put all, they can use other tools to encrypt some or all of their Dropbox, and that's fine. But, we, but we're moving forward where there's going to be this expectation that, of course, all my stuff is searchable, searchable and indexed. And, you know, if I click on a document in my Dropbox, that will render a preview. And, um, and so, you know, people will choose different trade-offs. And let's get to the, the Microsoft partnership, yeah. because you guys just announced this like an hour ago or something. Can you explain the, the thinking behind the partnership? Yeah, so we just announced uh, a big partnership with Microsoft where we have, we have a deep integration between Office and Dropbox. And this is pretty unusual probably for both of us, but what we realize is there is something like 1.2 billion people out there using Office, and there's 300 million Dropbox users. And one of the most popular and important things that they do with Dropbox is collaborate on Office documents, and something like 35 billion Office documents in Dropbox. And, um, and uh, so what we realized, we could, for people that use both, we can provide a really deeply integrated experience where if you're in Office, you can open up files from your Dropbox. If you're in Dropbox and you want to edit a PowerPoint on your iPad, you can seamlessly go back and forth between the two apps. Uh, which requires a bunch of, of technical integration work. But I can't think of another time something like this has happened. I can't think of any other uh, integrations that, that Microsoft or Office have done. And, and I think uh, this is really going to be great for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, why now? Why the partnership now? I mean, it's taken a long time to kind of get to this point. What is it about the relationship now? I know there's been a lot of change in management over there. I mean, what is it about now that you guys decided to do this? Well, I think f from our standpoint, the Office use case is a really important one. And our users always want us to do more to help them collaborate. And I think from Microsoft's standpoint, they want their users to have a good experience too. And, and when you talk to them, they, uh, the folks on the Office team said, they were like, look, we've had 40 million people download Office for iPad. And one of the top feature requests that we have is for Dropbox support because their company stuff is already in Dropbox, and that's what everybody's already using. And so. Um, for them, I think it's, it, it's a great way for them to offer their customers some choice. The Microsoft CEO recently kind of came under some fire for saying that women shouldn't ask for raises because it's bad karma. Um, that was an interesting mm -hmm. thing to, to say. I, what are your thoughts on those remarks? Since you guys, I guess, are working very closely with Microsoft, I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Well, my th I think that people, two people doing the same work should get the same compensation regardless of their gender, background, um, anything like that. And, 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 and that's really important to us. And, and, and you know, when, you, when you look into this more, there are things that get in the way of that. But it, it's always been important to us. And, and so you guys have I think like it's important to Microsoft, take, too. Because if it's, it's important, but, it's always, but it isn't the case in the Valley. I mean, the, there is kind of a, a divide if you look at the numbers. Do you guys actively kind of look at that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is a really important thing for us. And, you know, the way that Arash, my co-founder, and I think about it is, like, you know, I was pretty lucky in that when I was, like, two or three years old, I go in the living room, and my dad bought a PC. There's just a PC there, right? So I was able to get, like, a really um, early head start on this, and, and everybody should have that kind of opportunity. And, and when you look at the, the patterns, um, I think, you know, that there's things within a company's control, like, uh, not just compensation, but promotions. And, and, and there's, you know, when, when, you, when you learn more about this, there's all kinds of studies that have been done on how to, you know, on how to make sure that there aren't, aren't these kinds of biases. And then I think when you look more broadly, you know, when more than 80% of computer science graduates are men, for example, then we've got to do something about that issue that's broader than any one company. Um, and so, the, but there are some really promising early signs. And there are groups like code.org, which try to bring computer science education to everyone. And one of the really exciting things about that is something like 60% you know, of the people who have done the Hour of Code are from these underrepresented groups. And so I think technology can play a huge role, and the tech industry can play a huge role in giving everybody the same kinds of opportunities. 
when we talk about being a CEO, you say you're not born a CEO. Oftentimes we look at, and yeah. you were joking about Mark Zuckerberg, people think he woke up and he was a CEO. Yeah. Well, there was a, definitely a rough process. And, and not every founder, as we look at Twitter, lasts as CEO. When you go from small, scrappy startup to huge billion dollar company, mm -hmm. look at what happened to Sean Rad uh, just today. They, you know, we learned that the CEO of Tinder was kind of demoted. Was there ever a point, and be honest with me, because you're in a good place now, but was there ever a point um, when you were at Dropbox that you were worried that, you know, maybe the shoes were too big for you to fill, or maybe, you know, people were going to try to take away the CEO title? Was there ever that, that fear? Well, I think so the first thing is everybody has that feeling, uh, even the people who run these big companies. And, and the thing is that feeling never really goes away. And so what you, can, you can't control that. But what you can control is how you respond to it. Um, and so I think it's actually one of the great things about conferences like this and, um, and entrepreneurship in general is people, people are supportive, right? I've gone to a bunch of other CEOs, and they've mentored me and been really helpful. Um, and then when you study the stories of how a lot of these companies were built, all of them have rough patches. And every company goes through these crazy things. Like, this is not a natural thing, right? The companies are growing so quickly. Um, the markets are so competitive that, um, that of course, you're going to have problems. And so I think between building a support network for yourself and, and learning that this is something that every CEO goes through uh, was, was a big comfort for me. And you talk about the support network. And you said before you, you're kind of a sum of the five people, you, talented people yeah. you surround yourself with. Who's your five? I think it'd be hard to name all five, but I mean, it's, it's my, the people I went to college with. It's the other founders that did Y Combinator with me. It's um, the people who run uh, the other big internet companies. I th it, it really it's like changed. Mark Benioff, you guys are close, right? I, uh, Mark Benioff's a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, well, the, one of the guys I mentioned is this guy, Adam Smith. He was my fraternity brother, and he did a company that uh, got into Y Combinator a year before I did. Um, but really, every, it's, it's pretty much everyone in the tech industry uh, helps each other out. So what's next for, for Dropbox? What's your biggest priority for, for the near future? Well, so we're, we're a global company now. And we opened up our first office here, first outside office here in Dublin. But we've also been opening up offices in Sydney and Tokyo. And we'll have a bunch, uh, a bunch more offices in Europe and around the world. And one, one thing people might not know is that 70% of our users are actually outside the US. And that's been true since the beginning. Actually, we have more users in Europe than in the US. And so um, opening all these offices, scaling from 500 to 1,000 people this year, uh, launching a whole bunch of new products, solving a bunch of new problems for our users. So there's this been a lot going on. So if you could give yourself a cheat sheet. You talked about giving yourself a cheat sheet you know, when you went back and you spoke at graduation. If you could give your, uh, yourself a cheat sheet from when you started out being a CEO, what, what would it have on there? You can't use a tennis ball. You can't use sure. the 30,000 number. You've done that. What would you tell yourself? Well, I think anybody, I think people underestimate how much they can learn over like a five-year period. Uh, a big part, a, a big part of um, how I learned was just really basic things, like have it, finding people who are going through the same experience. I read dozens, if not hundreds, of books. And you know, this wasn't that rigor of, rigorous of a process. I was just like, you know, in college, I was like, all right, I, I'm an engineer, but I don't know anything about sales or marketing or management. And so what I would do is I would go on Amazon and type in like sales, marketing, management, and like read the top rated books on that. And you know, that's not the only thing uh, that you need to do. But you can actually, one thing that I wish I had known is that it's relatively, uh, that a lot of the great tech companies were started by engineers who figured out how to handle the business side on the job. It's really hard to go the other direction. Right. Um, and last question, because I know we, we've got to wrap up. Um, advice to founders. You know, if you could, uh, a lot of people in the audience are building out their own companies. They're in these high growth phases, or maybe they're just starting a company, uh, or thinking about investing in something. What, what is your advice? Well, I think some of the th things we covered would be, would be some of the important points. But the biggest dis difference between my first company and my second company is that I was, with Dropbox, I was working on a problem I really really love, I was obsessed with. And, and especially as you do this, as you do this for more than a few years, what you realize is 
um, or a surprise for me, was not just that we were working on storage or file synchronization. What we're really building is this home for all of our most important information. And this is something that all of us in this room need. Right? This is stuff that used to be like physical objects in your house that if it were burning down, you'd run to go get. Um, and so the problems are that, and that really motivates me to get up every morning thinking that, OK, if we sa save someone 10 minutes times you know, 300 million people, it's like thousands of years of pain that we eliminate. And when you think about what's next for Dropbox, there's like 3 billion connected internet users in the world. And even at 300 million, we're still this tiny fraction. Uh, we've only reached this tiny fraction of people that need something like Dropbox. Great. Drew, thank you so much. I think we're over. Great. Thanks, guys. Cool.